uh, welcome everyone. Um, uh, this event that you're at today, Once Upon a Panel Discussion, Storytelling as a Pedagogical Tool, came out of a brainstorming session that Westchester University's faculty mentoring program held. We have a nice solid faculty mentoring program and occasionally they try to get people together to network and through a little event some of us discovered that we uh, have various interests in storytelling so we thought why don't we do a little panel discussion talk about what we do and maybe share it with some others and hear what they're doing so that's why we're all here and so I want to thank um, the faculty mentoring program for helping to make this uh, possible. Um, what I'm going to do is just share a couple opening remarks and then our panelists will each say a few words about the projects and um, story related teaching that they are doing. And then we'll open it up just to general discussion and sharing. I know from some RSVPs that there's some people doing some interesting work with storytelling and they may want to share what they're doing. So if you are one of those people, think about what you might want to share. And at the end, we'll, we'll ask around and see if people want to make a plug for the stuff that they're working on. Um, so when I, I'm a, I guess we'll introduce the panelists. You can introduce yourselves when we go around for the sake of time. Um, uh, I am in the psych department at Westchester. And um, so as a psychologist, I'm interested in the story and how it helps us to understand human psychology. Uh, and when I was working on just preparing opening remarks for this, I thought, well, I'll look up what, what is a story. And I started realizing that there's this sort of controversial history with story in higher education. Uh, and so I'm just gonna share a few words about um, <laughs> what, it's the shortest history and story that you could possibly have, but just to recognize that, um, Story and storytelling has certainly made a comeback recently. Um, so let me reach down. Um, higher education, especially in the sciences where I am in, uh, and in the social sciences, there is a sort of the Western philosophical view of higher education and learning that I think pervades higher education is that the highest truths must involve emotionless, non-narrative, rationality, <clears throat> logic, and reductionism. So that kind of high science model um, that you sort of take the humanity out of it. You break things into boxes and you study small little chains of events, but the big story is not left for science. And that is sort of the Western philosophical view. So the story got kind of uh, underrated, but um, in the middle of last century, it made a comeback and a, across many disciplines um, in academia, um, the story has been rediscovered. And it's not that other people weren't well aware of the importance of story, but it was finally getting its um, uh, academic recognition. So uh, Rayfield talked about how there is a story shaped structure that's actually a natural psychological unit Fisher called humans homo nerens and suggested that uh, human beings are storytellers who, whose primary mode of understanding, assessing, and communicating is narrative. Um, Oliver Sacks said the narr this narrative is us. And psychologist McAdam said, we are storytellers and we are the stories we tell. Um, and that kind of new introduction to the narrative in higher education, I think is well entrenched at this point and many people are acknowledging that. And even science is coming around. In the Journal of uh, Science Communication, um, just in the last couple of years, they had a special issue devoted to storytelling in science. Um, and in a very science-focused journal, they said the soul of science is communication and focusing on this storied nature of communication. Uh, but nonetheless, there are still contemporary naysayers like the philosopher Strassen, who is outraged at the emphasis of story. I was surprised that I could find people that would have a problem with stories, but there are some naysayers who find this to be a bunch of gobbledygook. So Strassen says, I am not a story. I think it's false, false that everyone stories themselves, and it's false that it's always a good thing. 
So recognize there may be still a little work to do. I think one of the biggest things that we can do with this panel is talk about how we are already using story. I think some people are using it and they don't even recognize how it really is story that's um, empowering what they do. Um, so one last thing, and then we'll go on to the panelists that, that sort of practically speaking or pedagogically speaking, uh, stories are helpful for teaching, which is what we're focusing on as well here. And this is from an APA, American Psychological Association, like they need to be the ones to tell us that stories matter. But they said in teaching the following, stories can serve multiple functions in the classroom, including sparking student interest, aiding the flow of lectures, making material memorable, overcoming student resistance or anxiety, and building rapport between the instructor and the students or even among the students themselves. And I feel like that is gonna be well represented in what our panelists are gonna to share today. So I'm gonna stop share. And um, I believe, was it Rebecca who was gonna go first? Cause now I can't remember. Was it Rebecca or Deanna? Uh, I don't remember, I can go first, you want me to? <laughs> okay, and then we'll have Deanna and then Megan. Okay, all right. So do a little short introduction and I'll okay. sign off. Sounds good. So hi everyone, I'm Dr. Rebecca Rich. I'm in the Department of Health here. Um, and this is my first year. Um, so this is like, you know, the faculty mentoring program was how this all kind of got started. Um, but I um, wanted to kind of start with mentioning, and Lori, you kind of uh, got us to a good, uh, off to a good start good transition for me. Um, talking about using stories to complement the facts that we're using in our teaching. So that's kind of how I have gotten into this. Um, I'm in the health field, which is, like you said, very scientific in nature. Um, that non-narrative rationality is has been my experience in academia and in learning about health and um, health science. Um, and now that I'm teaching these kinds of things, um, I feel that this combination can be really beneficial. So I started this like journey to how I teach now, looking into um, feminist pedagogy. So I was, you know, it makes sense to me that feminist theory and health kind of go together. You know, the emphasis on equality, empowerment, social change, it makes sense. But as I started looking into that connection, um, it's not seen as much in health as you might expect or as I expected. Um, I see a lot of feminist pedagogy in nursing, but not so much in health. Um, but as I'm looking into feminist pedagogy, you know, as I'm, I'm developing some research and things, I realized that these are things that often we're, we're doing but we don't recognize that it is feminist pedagogy or that we are using stories in our teaching like for a purpose, right? So what I mean by feminist pedagogy kind of in a nutshell is that we're acknowledging that our students have lives outside of the classroom and we're allowing for creative learning and assessment in different ways, trying to um, incorporate that into classroom day-to-day -day activities, but also the assessments that we're doing. So that is all kind of what leads me to using story in, in my teaching. So classroom rapport is a big um, way that I think stories and narrative can kind of help us. Um, I always start my class my classes with this checking in period, which is something that I, you know, is a feminist pedagogical tool. And it's fairly informal, which is what I mean when I say, I think a lot of us are doing this, but we don't realize it. Just take a few minutes when we start our class before we get into the day's content, just to say, you know, how are you, what's going on? But I think when we are purposeful with this and when we can ask, you know, what are you struggling with? What can we celebrate right now? Um, what are some stressors? Um, students feel like they are acknowledge that you know you're not just a body in the classroom let's talk about what we're all dealing with and that makes them feel you know that they're in a place where they are able to learn then when they kind of can acknowledge all that other stuff that they're dealing with um so that's something that i think has been helpful but again if it's purposeful like that it makes the biggest difference um also we all i think naturally try to make these anecdotal connections to what we're teaching 
Um, but what I found, like, depending on the classes that I'm teaching, um, that can uh, create some trust in a way. So for example, um, I teach love and marriage, which lends itself to anecdotal connections in every lesson. Um, so I start by sharing some stories from my own life, but then that creates the opportunity for students to share stories that, you know, when we talk about some harder issues like divorce or life crises, they feel that they can share those stories and it adds to um, the learning experience compared to if we were just giving like textbook information that way. Um, I also teach uh, foundations of health education. And this can be seen as something like, okay, what were your experiences with good and bad health education growing up? And let's talk about that and why we experienced them that way. So sharing those stories about, you know, what they've all kind of gone through in their own education so that they can make sense of what we're learning in the class that way. Um, when it comes to assessment, so I really want to, you know, allow for this more um, private space for students to share their stories and demonstrate learning in their assessments. And one of my favorite things to do with that is found poetry. Um, and found poetry was a big part of my dissertation, but now I'm realizing that it can be included in my teaching too. So um, I, want to start using it in the um, health issues of women class. I think it, there's a lot of room for that there. But in love and marriage, it was useful this semester because one of the course objectives for that is students will have to develop their own um, definition of love. What does love mean to them? Because it is fairly individual, right? Um, so they were assigned to choose any song and use the lyrics to create a found poem that demonstrates their definition of love. So it was their way of kind of telling this story. And with permission from a student, I am able to share with you an example. So this student used, um, I think it's uh, Taylor Swift all too well, <laughs> not the 10 minute version, she used the shorter one, um, and found these words within the lyrics. So they're not direct lyrics from the song, but she was able to pull these uh, specific phrases and words to create this poem that tells her story of what she thinks love is. And then she gives the interpretation at the bottom that love is about the little things in a relationship. Remembering even the smallest details of a moment can take you back to understanding why you love your significant other. It's in the tiniest of moments that we feel the love from our partner. So not necessarily the meaning of the song, but she was able to use that to tell this story to demonstrate that um, kind of like demonstrate that learning from that portion of the course. So um, that's found poetry. I also like to allow students to develop a reflective journal. I did this in um, Health Issues of Women where you know some of the health issues that we might talk about are a little sensitive, might hit a little close to home. And we do have these anecdotal moments in that course, right? Where we talk about, you know, I'll share with them, you know, my own lived experience as a woman in women's health. Um, they'll share with me, but then there are some things that they don't really want to talk about out loud. And that's where this reflective journal can be really helpful because it gives them that space to be more private, but to process, you know, what they're learning, connect it to their reality outside of the classroom. Um, and then they submit that to me at the end of the semester as this product of their reflection on the content. Um, but the stories that they share in that um, really kind of highlight those connections that they're making. And then my, uh, so my, my two favorite things <laughs> that I've done with stories in my teaching are found poetry and the book club. And I, those are two things that I try to incorporate into any course. I think you can, you can do a lot of these things no matter what the content is that you're teaching is what I found. So I've done them with, um, you know, like foundations of health education, but also love and marriage and women's health and stress management. So it kind of is cross-cutting. Um, a book club, I think, is helpful because you can emphasize that combination of how students can use facts and stories in their learning. So um, in the Foundations of Health Education class, when I taught it previously, I had them uh, do a book club with these two books on the screen. So well, what we need to talk about when we talk about health is very um, factual, kind of scientific, like what are these hard-hitting issues right now. And then The Immortal Life of Henrietta Lacks 
can create conversation about very similar topics, but reads more like a novel. So we're gonna have students who are more um, prone to learn from fact-based information and others who are like, I would love to read a novel and talk about this stuff. So this kind of book club creates that opportunity for them to use story and then tell stories to each other in their book club meetings um, to you know, expand on what we've been talking about in the course. Um, I've also used a book club in stress management with um, a book about like meditation that was very story-based and another about self-care that was more factual. Um, and I'm doing a book club in love and marriage with the five love languages, um, which allows them to kind of share like, you know, which love language they are and how it all makes sense to them. Um, and it's usually a semester long project. Um, and they meet uh, with their book clubs without me there. So I, I give them that space to have, you know, they don't need my influence when they're um, having their book club meetings so that they can actually share their stories that way. Um, but I think that when they can do those kinds of activities, have those book club meetings, um, they can share and learn from each other. And it also instills that sense of compassion, which I think is what we really benefit from when we include stories in our teaching, as opposed to that factual non-narrative rationality. I'm gonna stick with that phrase, Lori. <laughs> um, but yeah, I think a lot of these things we're already, we're doing these things, but we could kind of like be more purposeful with the storytelling approach um, to benefit for our students. Okay. Stop share. Thank you. Okay, so I guess it's my turn. <laughs> yeah, we'll we'll hold questions till the end. So if you have any, just make a little note and we'll okay, so you're on. Thanks. Okay. All right, hang on a second. Let me just share my screen. So my name is Deanna Gabe. Um, I'm an adjunct instructor um, in the Department of Education Foundations and Policy Studies. Um, there we go. There we go. Um, and I teach primarily educational psychology. Um, so I started in the fall of 2019. So, <laughs> you know, right when, you know, the pandemic hit and it was a little bit crazy. Um, so I, I didn't use story all that much in, in that first year, but um, I, I'm trying to incorporate it you know, more into what I'm doing now. And so I think Becca is, is absolutely right that we're, we're using it um, not really, maybe not so intentionally. So it wasn't quite intentional for me in the beginning, but in, in, the, uh, in talking about things with Becca and Megan and Lori, I realized that, yeah, I really am using a lot of storytelling in my teaching. Um, and so there are a lot of things that are similar to what Becca just talked about um, I sort of start off with storytelling by having my students do personal introductions before we even get into the classroom. So I ask them to um, put a picture on D2L that <clears throat> reflects who they are. So it can be a picture of themselves or it can be, I get a lot of pictures of, you know, their pets or their best friends. Um, and it just, I love it because it gives me a, a mini story of who they are before we, we even meet. And so I get a sense of who they are as people. Um, <clears throat> and then once we begin the semester, I do purposeful check-ins. Um, I try to ask sometimes just fun questions, just to like break the ice, just to, you know, try to start the, our, our session together, our time together on kind of a playful note. I feel like, you know, often, um, you know, when students are feeling really stressed out, um, that can really, you know, help us to, you know, begin our, our time together on a, on a good note. Um, and then sometimes the check-ins are just, you know, how are you doing? How are you feeling? And as we get to know each other, um, they're more comfortable sharing in that way. Um, and then I like to do um, exit reflections. So um, we talked about this, um, you know, when we met in our brainstorming group, I sort of like bookend what I do. So I start with the check-in and then we have this reflection at the end. Um, so it's usually a question about, you know, the content, 
there is usually a question about the content, but then I always ask, is there anything else that I need to know? Um, and so I get a lot of stories from my students um, through that question. Um, and so, you know, sometimes, and, and sometimes I get information from them that can be, you know, um, troubling. So that, that's something I'll, I'll talk about in a second. But, but they, you know, are able to share their stories through these exit reflections. Um, and uh, so that it's really invaluable to me, I think, to get that information from them. Um, and then I, we do a lot of written reflections on um, the supplemental readings that I give them. Um, we do a lot of talking about like just sort of spontaneous making personal connections to because you know ed psych is a very theory driven class so um, being able to make personal connections I talk a lot about my own educational experiences or my kids educational experiences or things that I experienced um, with my children or students you know over the years to make connections to our course content and then the last thing that I do, or not the last thing, but the last thing that's here is um, I do a midterm survey. So I, which is, you know, open ended questions about the course and um, really, you know, any information that they want to give me. So it's a lot of low stakes writing, you know, it's not, these things aren't graded, um, you know, it's just a way for them to share their stories with me um, and for me to kind of do you know, um, formative diagnostics. So what I'd like to do moving forward is to start incorporating um, stories in two ways, you know, having them write more, but also incorporating stories in order to connect to the content of the class. So things that I that I'm using right now, and I see Brett Criswell is on the call, I use Atlas. So that's something that yeah, <laughs> I hope he'll talk about that. <laughs> um, but it's a video library of teachers, um, you know, teaching, and so that's that's one thing that I use. But I, I'd really love to start incorporating more fiction. Um, just off the top of my head, um, I've been compiling a list of of you know fiction that I can use. So there's a wonderful graphic novel called Good Talk by Mira Jacobs that, you know, really I could use throughout my whole semester. So I, I really want to use more fiction and I want to make it multimodal. So podcasts, um, you know, art, um, and then, you know, just asking students, what are the stories that, that they um, connect to when we're talking about um, our course content? Okay. So I think that um, Lori and I read the same article. <laughs> it looks like it, this is from Melanie Green. And um, so these are, yeah. <laughs> so these are some of the reasons that she gave for using stories. And um, it's so, Lori already sort of went through these. Um, but I just wanna talk about that last one a little bit, teaching a story from, uh, telling a story from experience can create a more personal um, student-teacher connection. So this actually is not um, something that happened um, while teaching at Westchester, but when I was doing my student teaching like a million years ago at Downingtown High School. <laughs> um, I remember um, so it, it was it was really like the funniest thing because my spouse and I don't watch WWF we don't watch wrestling, but for some reason <laughs> it was on on a Sunday morning. And we got sucked into it and we were watching this whole storyline play out. And then like the next day in school, a couple of my students who I, I had sort of a hard time connecting with were talking about it. And I was like, oh yeah, you know, didn't so-and-so kidnap so-and-so? And from that point on, we were golden, you know? So it was just such a wonderful way to connect with my students. Um, so, Last summer, I did the um, I participated in the um, Westchester Writing Project Summer Institute, and um, I was one of the things that I was thinking about and working on during that institute was thinking about um, writing pedagogy and how often we ask students to, you know, talk about 
difficult things, you know, um, in, in their writing. And um, so one of the things that popped up in my head is, you know, what happens when students do reveal, you know, traumatic stories, you know, I, I, you know, how do you, how do we deal with that? How do we manage that? And so I found the research of Michelle Day um, and she, um, she created um, a, a trauma informed writing pedagogy, but through her research, what she found was that teachers, you know, typically have three concerns. So one is that students are coddled. One is that teachers aren't therapists. And the last one is that institutions don't support trauma informed um, pedagogy. So <clears throat> I thought I, you know, would kind of throw these you know, themes out there um, for us to talk about, because I'm sure that, you know, that many of us have similar concerns. And so I'll, I'll just say briefly that, you know, to that first one, um, and, and maybe Megan can talk a little bit more about this, um, you know, usually the humanities, the, their definition of trauma is sort of abstract. It's not clinically informed, and it's a, an incomplete understanding of trauma. And so um, that's where that students are coddled concern can spring from, you know, that there's not like a complete understanding of what trauma is and how it impacts and lives in a person's body. Um, and then the second one that teachers aren't therapists. Um, so what Day talks about is that, you know, that always when we're when we're, you know, in a classroom, the main goal is education, not therapy. And so, you know, that's something that we really have to talk about with students and make that really clear, you know, in the beginning. Um, and then the last one, institutions don't support trauma informed pedagogy. Um, so she talked a lot about many different things, but the one thing that I'll bring out is that um, often we don't know what supports the our institutions offer. And so really having a good understanding of what supports are in place things that we wouldn't normally think of, like the tutoring center or the writing center, you know, um, spaces where students can go to receive help. Um, that it's not not just mental health. So, um, so that's, that's it for me. Um, thank you. All right, Megan, you're up. Thanks. You're muted. I'm now. muted. <laughs> <sighs> The joys of Zoom. Um, hi, everyone. Um, I'm Dr. Megan Corrado. I'm an assistant professor in the Master's School of Social Work. And I also am just, this is my second semester at Westchester along with Becca. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen with you all. So I want to share a little bit of the background behind um, my use of storytelling as a teaching tool. I think it's really important. Um, so first, um, I'm going to share with you all some of the foundations of my use of narrative, and then I'm going to talk to you specifically about some of the ways I've used narratives in the classroom. So I think that my uh, part of the foundation is me reading books, me reading and writing. This is me on my grandmother's bed, always had a book while I was eating, um, while I was supposed to be doing chores, I always had a little pile of books there waiting for me. And I was also writing all the time. So this is a prompt. I think this was actually from the second grade, um, back when they taught us cursive in the second grade. I wish that my parents, and then I like have all these complaints about my mom not getting me candy and getting toys and not spending enough time with me. Um, so I feel like my uh, understanding of narratives, all of our understanding of narratives begins at a very early age. It's really a part of our humanity. And then um, as a clinical social worker who was, was providing um, trauma treatment to um, kids, teenagers, to families, I use narratives a lot. Um, I've been a, a licensed clinical social worker for about 15 years now, and I've used narratives in all different formats to support people in navigating challenging behaviors and navigating traumas, sources of adversity, including poverty, abuse, neglect, all those different things. And so this is a mosaic that one of my clients made. Um, oftentimes we think about narratives as being um, written or spoken, but there's so many different potential formats for narratives. This narrative is a visual narrative um, that was created with glass. I've also supported clients in creating uh, 
uh, narratives and music. So uh, there's like the, also this uh, multidisciplinary narrative process that this particular client um, engaged in. Um, we actually uh, went into a we went into a recording studio after he had written the lyrics um, of a rap that he wanted to write. Which which rap is this one? Is this he wrote two? He wrote one about his enemies and one about his bros. This was the one about his enemies. Um, so um, you know he picked a beat and he also created the lyrics and put them all together. And this was also part of his narrative. He did have a lot of enemies. He was nine years old at the time that he um, wrote this wrote this song. And he had a lot of difficulty verbalizing and expressing what was going on between him and his peers, but he was able to do it in, in this rap. And it's very catchy, I might add as well. We won't listen to it today, but um, this is another visual narrative that one of my clients created, a client who had a history of um, self-harm, a history of um, suicidal ideation, suicidal thinking. Um, she was hospitalized multiple times and she'd also experienced a lot of trauma. And you can see here, um, this includes words, but it also includes like, you can feel it. And some of the feeling is coming from the words and some of the feelings are coming from the energy that she put into creating this collage. This is, um, this is a piece of my artwork. So um, I've also found myself not only enthralled by um, reading other people's narratives, by writing narratives, but also by creating visual narratives as well in my own artwork. And I would say that my use of narratives has been this parallel process between me telling my own story, me reading stories, me supporting other people and telling their narratives as well. And all of those kind of came together in my development of an intervention, which is called the Stories Trauma Narrative Intervention. So um, prior to coming to Westchester, I actually created a, um, a, a story format, a foundation for supporting people who've been through trauma and telling their trauma narrative. So basically the idea is to support someone in creating a timeline, um, reflecting on the timeline, looking at the events from their timeline a little bit at a time, um, looking at what happened and for each of the events, what happened, what they were thinking, what they were feeling, and then um, putting all of those things together, reflecting on those experiences, and then seeing what they want um, in their future vision. So that is kind of the, those are all the foundational um, experiences that led into my use of um, storytelling as a um, pedagogical tool as well. So I like to share that um, I was a clinician first, practicing on the ground, focusing specifically with people who've been through trauma, particularly particularly urban youth of color, um, and then taking what I was doing with those clients, with those families, and then thinking about, hmm, how can I potentially use this as a tool in the classroom to provide support to students, to reinforce concepts, um, to make connections, to do all of those um, wonderful things. So one way that I use stories is through case examples. I'm always using case examples. Um, it, uh, may, maybe too much. Well, my students haven't said too much yet, but I'm using them all the time. Um, and I'm using examples from my own clinical practice. I think a lot of times um, in social work education and education period, things feel very theoretical. And the more that I'm able to bring in examples of what does this look like in a person, the better. Um, we'll talk about this in a minute. Oftentimes students don't make the leap easily or smoothly or naturally from theory to practice. And the more that I'm able to include stories from my own clinical practice and bring those into the classroom, the more I think it makes um, these ideas alive for students. Sometimes they can um, kind of understand what a challenge, what a barrier, what a source of oppression looks like in a book. But then when they're you know, sitting in front of a person, it's a little hard for them to identify that. I also um, have students share examples from students from their own social work practice. So all of our students are simultaneously um, in the classroom um, learning, and they're also in the field learning. And that's a, that's a um, landmark or that's a, a, a part of our social work education process is that there's this um, dual learning that's happening. And um, I wouldn't say that this is specific to me at all, but um, across social work education, we are constantly, especially in our practice classes, encouraging students to bring in their stories from their internships, to bring in their stories of what they are seeing. And that includes positive experiences. It also experience, uh, it, it includes um, frustrating experiences, overwhelming experiences, so that we can process them together 
and that we can then um, kind of look, look at those situations from the lens of social work ethics and values and identify ways um, to move forward. I created a, a case consultation model that I've introduced to students um, as a way of talking about um, their field experiences. And I can actually share that with you all as a document in the chat as well. But um, a way, so sometimes when students are talking about what's happening in the field, it seems a little scattered or they tell a lot of details about things. And you're like, okay, you know, understand that all these details were very important because it might've been your first time experiencing this, but how do we kind of condense this information, get to the point and also figure out how we want to seek the support of our other classmates. So um, I created um, this process that I have students go through uh, where I break them into small groups. I have one of them share something that's happening, share the story of something that's happening in their field placement or their internship. It can be a challenge with the client. It can be a challenge with a, um, with a particular, uh, with, with the supervisor. It can be, you know, any type of challenge. And then the other people in the group are listening from the framework of social work values, from um, what's happening emotionally here. Um, what, what about evidence-based practice? So that's like a structured way that I'm supporting students and um, telling their narratives. I see that there's a question. I think we're gonna hold the questions until the end, but please, please remember um, your question for later. Um, yeah, so that there's this structured storytelling experience so that students kind of figure out how do I tell, like if, if, I'm, if I'm in my field placement agency, if I'm working in a social service organization, I have to figure out how to condense my story and make it clear so that other people know what I'm experiencing and know how to help me. Um, we also have uh, role plays and simulations, another thing that's very common in social work education. I like to do a tag team role play with, with students. They don't always love it, but they, they say later it was really helpful where I will have, I will be one of my clients and I will be one of my most resistant clients. And I, I'm kind of like telling the story of my experience and I'm having each of them, um, e each of the students is gonna be my clinician and they're gonna try to engage me. And when I've exhausted them, they have to tag in the next person. And when I've exhausted that person, they have to tag in the next person. And then they talk about kind of that client story, but then their own story of trying to navigate this particular resistant client. Um, the master's program at Westchester, and I wasn't familiar with simulation-based learning before coming to Westchester, but there are a ton of, uh, of opportunities for students to engage in simulation-based learning where they're practicing some of the skills that they're learning in the classroom um, with, with the student actor or with one another. Um, also use of case studies, use of case examples. Um, I, I purchased the book um, that has different, uh, different case studies based off of DSM diagnoses, um, psychological disorders, and it was really helpful in teaching students about the disorders because sometimes when they're looking at the symptom criteria, they're like, okay, this is a lot, but what does this look like in a person? So I would, you know, bring, we, we would kind of learn what are each of the kind of uh, um, the most pertinent things to remember about a particular diagnosis. And then they would have a case study where they would have to decide which diagnosis fits. And that case study is of course a story. Um, I think it's also important to connect theory to practice. Uh, it's not something that students, not all students do that naturally. So whenever I'm able to bring in um, a narrative, whether it's through music, whether it's through video, um, whether it's through dance, Whenever I'm able to bring in a narrative into the classroom, I do. Um, this is an example of a song that I used in, um, in a class session that I taught about trauma. So there is a song by um, the, rap, the rapper Meek Mill that talks specifically about trauma. So we went through all the different ways that trauma can impact people in the different trauma types. And I played the song and I had them write down all the different categories and types of trauma that Meek Mill references in the song. Um, and then we engaged in discussion about that as well. I've used music videos. Um, there's so many different examples of narratives where we can say, okay, this is the concept that we're trying to teach. Now, how can I find something, um, an engagement tool and also bring in a different voice to reinforce that concept? 
Um, I've used storytelling as a form of uh, reflective practice as well. So uh, in teaching social work students um, about self-care, I have brought in the story of Thidwick the Big-Hearted Moose. It's a Dr. Seuss book. And if you're not familiar with Thidwick, Thidwick decides to let all these animals live in his antlers to the point where he is tired, he is hungry, and uh, he is just weighed down. And, and Thidwick has to learn, you know what? I need to take these antlers off and I need to set some boundaries because if I don't, I'm gonna be hungry. So um, I've used I've used this uh, this story. I've used other narratives as well to support students and really thinking about um, and thinking about the impact that social work practice can have on them as people. This is just one example, but there's um, many other great examples that have parallels across all of our disciplines. I've also uh, directly introduced narrative interventions, so taught um, social workers about specific therapeutic modalities, therapeutic interventions that they can use. Um, so things like my story's trauma narrative intervention, narrative therapy, bibliotherapy or poetry therapy, narrative exposure therapy, trauma art narrative therapy, um, to really support students in being able to have specific tools and a specific skill set to help their clients tell their stories. And then I created a, a course called Storytelling and Social Work, and I was able to teach it this semester. Um, it has been an honor, a privilege, a joy to be able to work with students. I'm teaching students from the Philadelphia campus. Um, I have to say, I have never uh, teared up so much in a class before. Um, the power of narratives in all their different formats has just been amazing. So um, here are some of the learning objectives that I created for this elective. Um, understanding the potential benefits of narratives in social work practice. Um, understanding diverse narrative formats, considering how culture, context, life experiences impact individual and communal narratives. Um, identifying assessment tools for narratives. And as you can see, there's eight of these. I'm not going to read all of them to you all, but uh, just so you can get an idea of some of the ways that um, some, some of the things that we've been exploring together as a class. And then um, the class is divided into four modules. So we start off with an introduction to storytelling. What is a story? How, do, how does power and privilege play a, play a role in the development of stories? Um, what are the essential elements um, for what a story needs? We talk about um, specific narrative-based interventions that social workers can use. We talk about reflective narrative practice. So where does your own story fit in? Um, how can we channel pieces of our own story? Or how don't we want to channel pieces of our own story and work with marginalized communities? Um, and then we also talk about narrative application. So how can we integrate um, narrative interventions and work with individuals, families, communities, systems? And then just so you can get an idea of some of the assignments um, for this particular course. So this, this was my first time um, teaching this course and I just created it. I had this idea to create it and I was like, hmm, what should the assignments be that go along with this class? Um, I was not expecting to cry almost every week whenever I was hearing assignment one. So um, students, um, each student had to sign up for a day to share a story and they could share any story any format. It could be a fictional story, a clip from a film, a personal story, a song, a dance, another um, creative story format. And they had to share this story and briefly explain how this story connects to social work practice. And then they had to lead um, a mini discussion about the implications of this story for social work practice. And when I tell you students have, like they have dug deep, um, Things have, I'm trying to think of the stories that have been shared. Anything from like uh, clips, original films. I had one student who um, was telling her story as she was painting on her face. And she did a video of this. And each stroke, you couldn't quite tell what she was creating as she was speaking. And it all came together for her to create. She, she transformed herself into a butterfly as she was telling her, telling her story about transformation. Um, there's another student who, who shared, uh, it's an international student who shared their national, um, national anthem and the story behind the creation of the national anthem. There have been stories of oppression, stories of, of, um, 
of victory, stories of strength, also stories of um, racism, stories of systemic oppression. And it's been like, I, I was not expecting, um, I'm like, okay, you know, this sounds like a good idea for a class in storytelling. Um, we'll see what happens. And um, it has been incredible. And then there's, um, as you can see, other assignments too that support students in considering um, how to connect narratives to social work practice. All right, so that is the end of my sharing. Thank you, panelists. A lot of interesting stuff. Uh, there was one hand up, and uh, so maybe we'll start with the whoever had their hand up. No, I don't see. Okay, um, Jay. Yeah, why don't you go ahead? Um, uh, Dr. Uh, Corrado, is that correct? Corrado. Corrado, got it. Um, thank you. I'm actually a social work professor as well um, in a master's program. So if you wouldn't mind sharing that case consultation handout that would be awesome because I teach a field class this this summer and I really would like them to figure out how to how to condense their thoughts it says I know exactly what you're talking about they'll talk about things that don't have anything to do with the case so that'd be really helpful I don't have the chat enabled so uh, uh, perhaps if someone is interested in anything email me and I will connect you with the person that you have a question for I'm really sorry okay other questions comments I think I've been very interested in um, how not just I use storytelling in my teaching, but how to help the people, the students I work with use storytelling in their applications. Like I work with pre-service teachers and I try to help them think about designing curriculum around storylines. And as a science person teaching science teachers, that is imagine, as you imagine, it's a pretty heavy lift to get them to think differently. And I'm wondering what people think about how we help our students think about the work that they do in narratives and storylines. Someone in the panel want to weigh in? We can leave that as a rhetorical question and then we'll leave it unanswered. Is there someone else who would like to make a comment or Deanna, would you? I just, so Brett, do you mean how they, how they'll end up using um, story or narrative in their own teaching? Not just, I mean, I don't want to be just teaching as I understand we have a more expansive audience and just teacher educators here. Um, but I think um, considering how we help people in lots of walks of life and professions think about the value of storytelling and narrative to the work that they do and train them in that as well. Um, you know, I know I've given a lot of thought to how to help science people who, you know, back to some of the quotes that were presented earlier, this rational must be rational and objective and third person passive voice and how to think differently about that. Um, and I've made some headway, but I've also struggled with that. And so I'm wondering how we might get young people, our students to think about uh, storytelling as a um, resource for them. It's interesting, it, we have this academic passport at Westchester, which is, I think, just busy work for our students. I'm not sure what the reaction is to it, but they're supposed to be building a portfolio and create an academic narrative about their um, engagement with their material from their first year through their capstone course. Um, and I don't know how much students are using that to fashion a, a sort of professional or academic narrative, but that is one way the university is trying to tap into this, I suppose. So the, the other thing that just kind of jumped into my mind is that, I mean, this is not something that I do intentionally to have them think about narrative or story, but, but we do try to have, and I'm going to talk about teachers now because that's who I teach, pre-service teachers, but we do try to have them think about their teaching philosophy or their philosophy of education. Um, and so part of that is having them think about their own positionality, you know, to, and also to, to think about their own stories, you know, and how those, and how like the, the story, like their story impacts how they kind of go out and show up in the world um, in the work that they do. And then the other part of it is, you know, like discussions around, you know, the, the idea that, you know, we, we can never really be fully objective or neutral, you know, because there's this, 
idea that, you know, especially in teaching that you have to be neutral and, and, and never, you know, have an opinion. And so I think, you know, that, that might, you know, be some way that, you know, we can, I work with students anyway, to help them think about their own stories. I think also, um, if we take a step back, normalizing diversity is really important, is a really important foundation to introducing narratives. Uh, because when we're talking about narratives, we're talking about all these diverse perspectives. Um, we can all see the same thing and interpret it in different ways. But if the foundation is not an acceptance of the fact that everybody learns differently or everybody has a different perspective, then when we try and introduce a storytelling modality, it might be met with some resistance if diversity is not already, you know, is, is not already a really important foundational principle too, because a lot of narrative work, especially in like therapeutic settings is really, is really based in, in social constructivist theory. Like that we can all look at the same thing and see all of these different perspectives and that there's like multiple narratives and that necessitates diversity. But if we don't, and I'm not saying that, that you all, that, that your field of study is not doing this, but I just wanted to, to share that, that I think that that's a really important foundation. I think that's a great point. And actually the early philosophers wanted to suggest there should only be one story and we need to control the, <laughs> all the others. There's some interesting writings about that. Um, uh, so yeah, great point. Um, Ronnie, do you have a question? Ronnie, there is a problem with your audio that's um, kind of unusual. It's really making it high speed. Um, do you want? Yeah, I, we, I don't think we could hear. You, if you want to email me your question quick, if there's time, I can read it out loud. If you want to send it as an email to me, now I'll hire. Um, something else just came to mind um, relating to the question about like how do we get like science brains comfortable with stories and narrative and you know like get steering them away from like okay we have to memorize this stuff in the textbook because I think sometimes that's what they expect with you know if they're in certain majors or maybe if they're going to teach certain things so I think part of that is just creating those moments in the classroom or within their assessments where they get those different kind of creative opportunities. And that's why sometimes like with my book club example, I give them that space without me listening because then they can just kind of like play around with how do we have conversations with our classmates about um, these stories that we're reading so that it's not like, okay, what do we have to check off the list? It's not like that. Um, you know, maybe what they're used to with more scientific approaches, but just a more creative kind of like comfortable um, approach. So it might be helpful. <laughs>